Hello, and welcome to the Singapore Sessions, a series about what Canada can learn from the Lion City. I'm your host, Emma Cochran, and in this episode, we're doing a brief intro to Singapore and an overview of the topics for our series. For those of you unfamiliar with Singapore, it's a small island nation. It's in Southeast Asia, just south of Malaysia. It's a small country. It has an area of about 740 kilometers squared. So for the Canadians listening, that is about one eighth of the size of PEI. So it's small. And as a result, they face a lot of resource constraints, whether it's food, water, natural resources, land to build on. But Despite its size and the lack of resources, it's home to almost 6 million people. GDP per capita is one of the highest in the world. It's the second busiest trading port in the world after Shanghai. And it's a leader in global finance up there with New York, London, Hong Kong. And most of this development has happened in the last 60 years. Singapore only became an independent country in 1965. I'm not going to go too deep into the history here, but basically from the early 1800s, it was established as a British trading post by Sir Stamford Raffles, and then it was a British colony. It was briefly under the control of the Japanese during World War II. British again, became self-governing, joined Malaysia briefly, and then in 65, it became fully independent. The People's Action Party, founded by Lee Kuan Yew, who's a monumental figure in Singapore's history, has been in power since that time. So politically, it's quite different from Canada, where we have all of these different levels of government, municipal, provincial, federal, we have all these different stakeholders. Governments switch over every four to eight years, so we have different priorities. There, they have one level of government, same party's been in charge for 60 years. So I think that's important to keep in mind when we talk about sort of the big whole of nation projects that they take on. It's a very different political context there. Culturally, very diverse. There's four national languages, English, Tamil, Malay, and Mandarin. This diversity is partially because when Raffles established the British port, he designated it a free trade port. And so that brought entrepreneurs from elsewhere in Southeast Asia and India, China, the Philippines, Indonesia, plus the colonial traders from Europe. And so it brought together all of these different cultural influences. From a climate perspective, it's very hot. It's a tropical climate. I think the lowest temperature ever recorded was 19 degrees Celsius. It's usually closer to 30 degrees. I'm not going to go into extreme heat in this series or talk too much about climate, but it is something that Canada can absolutely learn from Singapore as we start to experience more extreme weather because they've had a long history of figuring out how to deal with that. One thing that we will dig into is housing policy. Singapore has a very high home ownership rate with over 90% of Singaporeans owning their own home and almost 80% of residents live in government units. So I think this is really interesting to unpack in a moment where our government is trying to figure out how to address a housing crisis and talking about potentially building more homes themselves. And so this is an interesting model to look at because it is very different than what's happening here. Big picture, why do we look to Singapore for inspiration? For the future cities program specifically, Singapore is an interesting example of the integration of foresight into governance. So they have a what's called the Center for Strategic Futures that sits within PMO and helps the entire public service anticipate and respond to emerging challenges and opportunities. Not only do they practice foresight themselves, but they are also charged with teaching the rest of the public service how to sort of think about and work with the future. And I think partially because of this, partially because of how quickly the country has developed, there does seem to be kind of an openness to evolution and progress in Singapore that we don't necessarily see here. So there's lots that we can learn. 
I'm going to focus on three areas. The first is scarcity and ingenuity and the way that Singapore has been able to build a really thriving economy with very few natural resources. And then we'll talk housing futures, comparing the two models and trying to understand what we might be able to learn from that. And finally, we'll talk identity as infrastructure and looking at the way that Singapore has taken active steps to build a sense of national unity and national identity over their relatively short time as a nation. 